A toddler accidentally drank his mom's essential oils. He was found gasping for air when he was brought to the emergency room before being treated. A teenage boy rubbed an entire tube of minty pain relief cream on all the parts in between his legs. His friends laughed as they found him on the floor in the bathroom hours later. The videos telling the story of these cases are linked in the description below. In both of these particular cases, they describe the same poisoning, acute salicylate toxicity. We're gonna focus on the boy who rubbed an entire tube of Bengay in between his legs. For both of these cases, you may think that they're contemporary and modern, essential oils get ton of hype on social media, various user groups online, mom groups, talking and writing about them prolifically. It's part of the push for natural remedies. You even see essential oils for sale at big grocery stores like Whole Foods, but humans have been using essential oils for various purposes for thousands of years. In fact, the pain relief rubefacient, Bengay, Icy Hot, Tiger Balm, they're made of essential oils compounded into a formulation that can be applied topically. The active ingredient oil in question for both cases is the same, methyl salicylate. The route of administration in both cases was different. A toddler drank the oil, so we have an oral route, and the other boy applied it topically, so a dermal absorption. There's a difference in absorption and distribution into the body between these routes of administration. However, metabolism and elimination are roughly going to be the same. Because we're in the setting of toxicity, it's nothing like what we know of in the therapeutic doses. And finally, another element of timelessness in these cases, relatively, is my own grandfather was born in 1906, China. Just for context of how long ago that was, it was still considered the Qing Dynasty back then. 1911 hadn't happened yet, which was the year that the Republic was established. Over there, and during that time, Grandpa was familiar with Tiger Balm, which is still sold here in the United States. That's equivalent to the pain relief cream from my video. In the 1990s, when he was 90 years old and I was a teenager, my grandfather told me about young men applying Tiger Balm on their scrotum as a joke, as a challenge, as a way to mess with each other. I suspect he didn't want to tell me about the self-stimulation that's documented to happen today. I have no doubts that it happened back then, Maybe he knew about it, maybe he didn't. But all of this happened when he was in his 20s, which was in the 1920s. So 100 years later, in the 2020s, the balm, the cream, the ointment, it still exists, and young people's nature is still the same. It really hurts when it's applied to the region. I think any man who has applied the cream somewhere and used the bathroom or rubbed their eyes have suffered from this pain. It really burns on those areas, and it's not supposed to be applied there, but it can happen by accident. So we're looking at methyl salicylate as the active ingredient. Acetyl salicylic acid is aspirin. Salicylate derivatives are some of the most common over-the-counter medicines today. It's implied here that all salicylates have the same properties because in vivo, all of these become salicylate, which is the conjugate base of salicylic acid. Salicylic acid was isolated in the 1800s, but again, the usage of derivatives of the original compound goes back thousands of years. The ancient Egyptians recognized pain-relieving effects of concoctions made from willow leaves and myrtle. The Ebers papyrus tells us that they knew that willow could be used for fevers, for aches, and for pains. Hippocrates in ancient Greece used willow bark and leaves from the Salix species to brew a tea to ease the pain of childbirth and to help with fever. Salicin was isolated from willow bark in 1829. Then salicylic acid was isolated before 1840. It was used to treat gout and fever, and so you have anti-inflammatory. And then, just before 1900, we get acetyl salicylic acid aspirin. We're always learning new things about salicylates, while in the early 1900s it was used for pain and for fever. In the 1970s, landmark trials demonstrated that it inhibits platelet function. Why would that be important? Well, heart attacks are a result of blood flow to the heart muscle getting blocked. How does it get blocked? It starts with a fatty plaque that builds up over decades in the arteries of the heart. The plaque builds over itself and becomes part of the artery. As it builds more and more, one day, it ruptures. And what happens when you get tissue injury? Blood clot forms. As that clot assembles where that plaque ruptured, now there's vasoocclusion and it's significant. Well, if aspirin inhibits platelet function and blood clots are made of platelets, can aspirin help reduce the chance of a heart attack? Strokes are also caused by blood clots floating into the vessels of the brain blocking flow. Could aspirin help in preventing those too? So the compound that we have in stomach remedy like 
Pepto-Bismol and face wash is also not just for pain, for inflammation, but it's also an antiplatelet. And because it has so many functions and because it's so common, we probably want to know what happens and what it looks like when people take too much of it. So we've already established that salicylate is an anti-inflammatory, but more specifically, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. I remember when I was a student, the non-steroidal part always threw me off because when you say the word steroid to anyone in their early 20s, especially men, more often than not, they're gonna think of anabolic steroids. When in medicine, overwhelmingly, the word refers to corticosteroids, which are hormones on a different pathway. NSAIDs function generally by inhibiting cyclooxygenase, COX, which enables the production of prostaglandin, which mediates inflammation and fever. In practice today, we would really try to use other agents for fever other than aspirin. Inflammatory pain like muscle aches is in part caused by prostaglandin liberated by bradykinin and cytokines. Cytokines like interleukins and interferons cause fever in that they increase synthesis of prostaglandin, which increases cyclic AMP, triggering the hypothalamus to elevate the body temperature set point. Platelets can't regenerate COX-1. What's their lifespan? between eight and 12 days. So if aspirin blocks COX-1, then you're in turn limiting its ability to produce prostaglandin, thus some antiplatelet activity. So if you block the ability of platelets to form a clot and a clot is needed to help stop bleeding, then someone taking aspirin could be more susceptible to bleeds. This is all in normal function at what we've known as therapeutic doses, not when someone drinks an entire bottle of methyl salicylate or has 50 tablets worth of aspirin 325 milligrams absorbed through their scrotum. So what happens when someone does that? At toxic doses, salicylate impairs ATP synthesis. So by definition, this involves the mitochondria. A single mitochondrion has an inner and outer membrane. As the electrons flow down the transport chain on the inner membrane, the released energy pumps protons out of the matrix into the mitochondrial intermembrane space, producing an electrical and pH gradient across the inner membrane. Oxygen gets combined with the electrons moving down the chain to form water. Remember, electrons are negative charges. The positive H plus ions, protons, that concentrate in the intermembrane space re-enter the mitochondrion through a pore in ATP synthase protein that spans the inner membrane, which provides energy needed to make ATP from ADP and phosphate. ATP production from oxidative phosphorylation is coupled to oxygen consumption. That is, the flow of electrons is coupled to ATP production. They need to happen together. Salicylate makes it so that they don't happen together so then ATP isn't made. This means that salicylate is an uncoupler of oxidative phosphorylation. So how does this happen? We know of at least two mechanisms. Salicylic acid we consider a weak organic acid, organic meaning carbon containing. Because of this, unionized salicylic acid crosses into the inner membrane. Because the matrix has a higher pH than the intermembrane space, the salicylic acid deposits a proton. Then the ionized salicylate gets transported out of the mitochondria. We'll come back to what that ionized form does in a moment. The second mechanism that appears to be happening is that there's formation of pores in the inner mitochondrial membrane created by salicylic acid, and this becomes permeable to protons. So both of these mechanisms result in the same end, the dissipation of the proton gradient needed to flow through ATP synthase to produce ATP. Salicylic acid deposits in H+. Salicylic acid promotes the movement of protons out of the inner membrane. With a relative balance and equilibrium of the concentration gradient across the membranes, there isn't just a flow anymore through the synthase and thus ATP isn't made. But remember, this means that it's uncoupled. Coupled means two, so if part one isn't happening, the other part could still be happening. That other part, electron transport chain and oxygen consumption, are still happening without the end result of ATP production. This is like the wheels are spinning, but they aren't touching the ground so that there's no movement. And when the wheel spins, it's expecting feedback on forward velocity, but that velocity is zero. It keeps spinning faster and faster as the uncoupling is widespread. Hyperthermia can result instead of ATP production, resulting in a fever. 
this is a major inhibition of ATP production in the setting of salicylate overdose. Remember, we're not gonna see this happen everywhere when we're at therapeutic doses, but drinking a whole bottle of methyl salicylate or rubbing a whole tube of Bengue in between your legs and have the methyl salicylate absorb directly into your bloodstream is a toxic dose. The cells use glucose to create ATP, so we can expect that levels will fluctuate during salicylate intoxication. Hyperglycemia starts from increased epinephrine release in the body with glucagon secretion. This mobilizes glycogen stores. Inevitably, this can become hypoglycemia after a while when serum glucose levels should normalize. So there's variability based on person and on time, and this was observed in the patient. What was also observed was also his tachypnea. Breathing fast decreases carbon dioxide. Less carbon dioxide means respiratory alkalosis, so a higher pH, but is it really? Well, kind of. It appears to be a compensatory mechanism, meaning that if the body's trying to shift towards an alkaline state, there could be an underlying metabolic acidosis. How does salicylate cause this? This is what we know right now. ATP isn't made. Glycolysis, glycolysis, is the breakdown of sugar as an attempt to meet ATP requirements, since ATP isn't being made. But that process doesn't appear to really produce acid. Consuming ATP does produce acid, and in regular function, the body balances out that acid production by creating ATP, which in salicylate poisoning isn't happening. Without consuming any of the acid that's produced by ATP hydrolysis, it builds up, resulting in a net positive balance of acid. Salicylate toxicity metabolic acidosis is high anion ion gap, although the lab test will sometimes get the negative salicylate ion as chloride. The acidosis is also a ketoacidosis. Salicylate stimulates lipolysis. You're not going to lose significant weight from it, but it promotes ketone production. On this podcast, I discussed back in 2021 about someone who survived a dinitrophenol accident. He used it as a weight loss chemical, and in a toxic setting, it's also an uncoupler of oxidative phosphorylation. It's a mitochondrial toxin in exactly the same way as salicylate, except salicylates have therapeutic benefit used in billions of humans at the correct doses. Dinitrophenol has not yet demonstrated those therapeutic benefits in that number of people. In that vein, I remember back in my powerlifting days, we had people at the powerlifting and bodybuilding gyms in Illinois take aspirin because they read somewhere online that it stimulates lipolysis and promotes ketosis, among all the other things that they would take, and they got their own ideas about how it would help them get ripped for their show. These were actual competitors, and this was before social media era. And in 2003, you weren't making more money and more fame because Instagram didn't exist. It's been almost 20 years now, and some of those people lived really, really fast. General rule of thumb, if you don't need to put it in your body, don't put it in your body. What happens when your cells can't make enough ATP? At a minimum, cells need to use energy in order to regulate volume. Sodium, potassium, ATPase generate electrochemical gradients necessary for secondary active and passive ion transport. And remember, wherever sodium is, water will flow towards it. Without ATP to operate this pump embedded in the cellular membrane, correct solute gain and loss can't be had. Passive transport predominates, but it's not adequate, leading to cerebral edema. The respiratory center is affected. Sometimes there's tinnitus, but it could present as the patient saying, I can't hear. They might not be aware of any ringing. Generally, agitation, combativeness, disorientation, confusion, hallucination indicates serious neurotoxicity. CNS depression or convulsions are going to have poor prognosis. All of this while the body is desperately trying to shift alkalemic, bringing us to the kidneys. In this case, I mentioned that the patient presented with polyuria. His kidneys were failing, and with the metabolic derangements, rhabdomyolysis is possible in this setting. Added together, you have renal failure, extreme hyperglycemia, abdominal pain, and nausea, vomiting. The patient looked like they were in diabetic ketoacidosis. Blood glucose is a really common and easy measure to get. On the other hand, salicylate levels are not common. They're also not particularly accurate. Salicylate toxicity is generally not going to be the first thing that you think of in a teenage patient, because why would they take anything related to it? In both cases, people said that you should have been able to smell the methyl salicylate on them, but have you ever smelled an emergency room? It's hit or miss, and the hit can be pretty hard. 
and it can mask all of the smells that you might think that you could get. The reason that DKA is a problem is that there's a lot of similarities with salicylate, but the treatments are different. And the longer that you wait thinking that it's DKA when it's actually salicylate toxicity, the worse things are going to turn out. In pediatric DKA, you wanna avoid cerebral and pulmonary edema. There are studies that show that in patients of these age, cerebral edema is present subclinically more than 50% of the time, and so treatment should be slower in infusions. Current thinking is that you don't wanna bolus these patients with insulin and fluids because that you could worsen that cerebral edema, especially if the evidence says that it's more than likely present subclinically so it's not even causing problems. And blood salicylate levels don't always correlate to the degree of toxicity. So you can get a level, but it might only just tell you that some salicylate is present and not much else. Why is that? Let's say the initial intake was a lethal dose and the blood levels return low, but the patient looks terrible. They're hypotensive, possibly hyperthermic, acidotic, unconscious, just had a convulsion after being confused and disoriented, and you've done nothing about the salicylate poisoning because the patient didn't tell you, and they came in hours after the ingestion. Well, if the salicylate has exited the blood and absorbed into the tissue, then it makes sense that the blood levels are low. It's not there. It's not low because the body has eliminated it and it makes sense that the patient looks terrible because the salicylate is exerting its toxic effects in the organs. And given that you don't know that they ingested and absorbed that toxic salicylate dose, and this is something that's going to happen within minutes of the patient being admitted, a patient that's possibly hypotensive, possibly hyperthermic, acidotic, unconscious, that might be the one that you'll want to intubate so that you can control their ventilation, but overwhelmingly, that is definitely not what you want to do in this salicylate poisoned patient. As blood pH drops, it becomes more acidotic. The equilibrium of salicylate shift towards salicylic acid. Unionized molecule can cross cell membranes freely, meaning that salicylic acid can absorb right into the tissue at lower pH. The body tries to compensate for this by breathing quicker, but eventually the metabolic acidosis will predominate and lower blood pHs will trigger rapid absorption into the brain, disrupting ATP production, disturbing fluid balance, causing cerebral edema. And the absorption into tissue doesn't appear reversible at this point in time, meaning that once the patient is deteriorating clinically, it might be too late. This brings us back to DKA from the case. If salicylate becomes unionized at lower pH, it absorbs freely into tissue at the lower pH. The absorption into tissue leads to how it enters cells to exert its toxic effect. And if all of this is happening, then the answer is to make it so that it never becomes unionized in the first place. The body tries to do this by breathing faster and harder to maintain respiratory alkalosis. But can we also start bicarbonate infusions aggressively as possible to maintain alkalemia? The answer is yes. This is where the disconnect with DKA is. Bicarbonate is not recommended in pediatric DKA because of lack of clinical benefit, but also it decreases the stimulus for hyperventilation, causing a fall in cerebral pH as CO2 enters into the brain. Bicarb therapy is also shown to have an association with an increased risk for cerebral edema as it also worsens hypokalemia. There could be a case to use bicarb in DKA when there's severe acidosis, but if the pH is 6.9 and it's a really a case of salicylate poisoning, that patient's probably going to be in big trouble. You could presume DKA at first, like in this case, but you'll want the extensive history that you gather to reveal what you need about the patient. In the case of applying an entire tube of Bengue or Icy Hot on their scrotum, if it's a kid or a teenager, they probably don't want to tell you about that because they might have been doing it for reasons that would be embarrassing. Bringing us to the final point. In the case, I talked about how the scrotum was demonstrated to have a 42 times more absorption of radio-labeled cream as compared to the forearm. We've known that for a long time, that highly vascularized parts of the skin can potentially absorb medicines inappropriately. Generally, people, even from my grandpa's time, aren't going to apply an entire tube of cream on their scrotum, but with more and more people doing this for self-stimulation purposes, it might be more common now in this excessive dose than before. But it's not limited to just the scrotum. In 2007, there was a female athlete who was in high school who died in her sleep and autopsy found salicylate in her blood. She was reported to have used copious amounts of pain relief cream and would use compression stockings to lock it in at night. It's likely that she applied it to such a large surface area that enough methyl salicylate absorbed into her body. And according to the report, it's not like she would do this once. It was repeated administration over days that led to this as the salicylate level was likely increasing in her blood to the point where it caused 
significant toxicity. One last point is that vaginal mucosa, my guess, will have similar absorption to the scrotum, as we know that it does absorb medicines. Although it's rare that anyone would apply a rubefaction into an orifice, the principle still stands. Don't put this in between your legs, no matter what parts you have. So, to summarize, at toxic doses, salicylate uncouples oxidative phosphorylation that results in decreased ATP production. Not enough ATP is available for use. Consumption overwhelms production. This causes hypermetabolism and metabolic acidosis. Hypermetabolism stimulates breathing, leading to an attempted respiratory alkalosis to reverse the acidosis. But the metabolic acidosis predominates and overwhelms the compensatory mechanism. It worsens, causing a decrease in pH. The lower the pH gets, the more salicylate absorbs into tissue because the unionized form crosses freely into the cells, exerting its toxic effect. As it goes into the brain and the heart, those cells can no longer maintain fluid balance due to the absence of ATP, causing edema, causing permanent damage, and resulting in death. The best way to treat this is to make it so that the acidosis can't predominate. Bicarb and breathing should be at the top of mind, but sometimes enough time has passed by the time the patient presents that the poisoning might be really advanced. Luckily for the patient in the chubby emu video, it was just in time.